The worst day of Paul Wilson's life began with a phone call from his daughter. She called me and said, Dad, what's going on at Mom's salon? There's police and helicopters everywhere. His wife, Christy, was at her hair salon in Seal Beach, a sleepy town in Orange County, California. I, I just had this feeling in my gut that something was bad, so I immediately jumped in my car. I ran red lights, I had my flashers on, I was honking my horn, um, and I was hoping that somebody would pull me over, so I, a police officer, so I could ask him, you know, what's going on in, in Seal Beach? Minutes later, he arrived at what turned out to be a crime scene. A man, later identified as Scott DeCry, had entered the salon and opened fire on his ex-wife, Michelle, and several others, including Paul's wife, Christy. I know that Christy was getting her hair washed by Michelle. Scott came in through the side door, uh, immediately shot Michelle, and then shot Christy. I kind of think almost that Christy didn't, she was laying down, I don't even know if she saw him or she knew what happened to her. It was October 12, 2011, and by the end of it, eight people were dead, one critically wounded. Two and a half years later, Scott DeCry pled guilty to eight counts of murder. This was a pretty clear, uncomplicated case. The largest mass shooting in Orange County history. Correct. The gunman confesses, pleads Correct. guilty. Correct. Did you ever imagine it would get complicated? Not in my wildest thoughts would it be to where, we, to where I stand today with this complete mess. And what a mess it is. The Orange County District Attorney's Office, which prosecuted Scott DeCry, is now at the center of an unprecedented scandal. They're accused of participating in a secret operation involving jailhouse informants and hiding evidence of it for as long as 30 years. And it probably would have remained hidden if not for the DeCry case. While preparing for the penalty phase of the trial, DeCry's attorney, Scott Sanders, noticed something. A jailhouse informant who had gathered intelligence on DeCry had done the same thing in another one of his cases. Was it a coincidence? Sanders started investigating. A year later, he delivered this 500-page bombshell, accusing the district attorney and the sheriff's department of deception and concealment and perjury and using jailhouse informants to get illegal confessions from dozens of inmates. Sanders declined to comment because of ongoing prosecutions. America Tonight has obtained recorded conversations between the police and jailhouse informants, which have never before aired. Here, an informant facing a third strike bargains with deputies, claiming his memory can fall back in place if the deputies will meet halfway. Okay, so you're looking for some consideration on the case you're here for in exchange for information on two unsolved murders in San Ana? Pretty much, yeah. Well, not pretty much. Is there anything else other than that? No, I think a little bit more than consideration I'm looking for. What does that mean? Well, uh, some options. Options would be nice. Right now I'm in a place of no options. According to court files, these informants were used in hundreds of cases. Were they all just at the right place at the right time? Or were they planted there? There's a big difference. Erwin Chemerinsky is the dean of the University of California Irvine Law School. If somebody who's in a jail on his or her own talks to a cellmate or another inmate, then there's no problem with the person who's received the information turning it over to the police, to the deputy sheriffs, to the attorney's office. But what's impermissible is to try to arrange to gather information through the use of jailhouse informants. No, no. Because then it really is about circumventing the person who's in jail's right to an attorney, the right to remain silent. And what apparently has occurred here is they've done exactly what's prohibited. In other words, deputies planted informants in defendant's cell. In effect, circumventing the accused's constitutional right to remain silent and then lied about it over and over again. Good afternoon, counsel. In March of this year, Orange County Judge Thomas Gothels responded with an extraordinary action. He fired the entire DA's office from the decry case. And the judge did so specifically finding that there had been systematic violations of the defendant's constitutional rights to the use of these jailhouse informants. 
In the wake of Sanders' explosive charges, other criminal defense attorneys like James Crawford began to ask questions. Ten years after his client, Henry Rodriguez, was convicted of murder, Crawford received records he'd previously been told didn't exist. Early on, Mr. Garrity had already established that he was an informant. Records which showed a veteran informant was planted in his client's cell. That informant's testimony was the only evidence used to convict Rodriguez of murder, says Crawford. The prosecution concealed this exculpatory information from not just my case and Henry Rodriguez, but hundreds if not thousands of other defense attorneys and defense defendants. These documents are constitutionally required to be disclosed. We're now learning that they've been hidden. That's a serious, major constitutional violation. Just two weeks ago, James Crawford asked for a new trial based on these newly discovered documents, so-called tread records, detailing the use of informants. It was in front of the same judge who had fired the entire DA's office from the decry case. Candidly, until a couple of months ago, despite the fact that I have worked in the criminal justice system in this county for 38 years as a prosecutor, defense attorney, and judge, I never knew there were tread records. So I'm hoping that people will to pay attention to what actually occurred in this case. The prosecution should not be seeking convictions. They have to be seeking justice. But Orange County prosecutors may have committed an injustice in the case of Thomas Thompson. He was convicted of murder based largely on testimony of a veteran informant labeled unreliable in this police file. It was a file the jury never saw. Thompson maintained his innocence until the day he was executed in 1998. How do you write that wrong? I mean, if a person actually lost his life as a result of the prosecution concealing that should have been disclosed to his defense, how do you write that wrong? This is why it's so important that the use of jailhouse informants be limited to what the Constitution allows. It's why it's so troubling that the Orange County District Attorney's Office seems to systematically devise the policy and implement it to undermine the Constitution. Thanks to questionable informants, a judge has let one admitted killer walk free. Isaac Palacios admitted to shooting a rival gang member 15 times, which could have gotten him life in prison. Instead, he did less than five years. And at least four convicted murderers and attempted murderers had their cases dropped or sentences reduced. And there may be a lot more. The Orange County District Attorney, Tony Rakakis, declined comment, but has said any missteps were not deliberate. The Orange County Sheriff, Sandra Hutchins, wasn't available for comment, but has admitted mistakes have been made and are being investigated. There are now calls to bring in the feds. I think an investigation by the United States Department of Justice would be appropriate. I also think the state on its own should create a top-level Blue Ribbon Commission with full investigative power to find out what happened. As for Paul Wilson, the trial of his wife's alleged murderer will likely be delayed for years because of the prosecution mess. He says he's emotionally worn out, reliving the crime. I can't tell you uh, when I've got to go to court, I sit in the very front row. I mean, I sit 10 feet away from the guy that murdered my wife and it drains me. It just, it takes everything out of my soul to have to do it that day and to know that because of the district attorney and their negligence and their stupidity that I've got to endure probably another four to six years of this is, it's sickening. I can imagine there are people listening to you right now who would say, yeah, maybe the district attorney's office pushed the envelope a little too far, but they went to gather information that could be used to justifiably put murderers away. Mm -hmm. So be it. But they're breaking the law. What makes it okay for them and not somebody else? Just because you're an elected official doesn't give you the right to break the law. Nobody's above the law. Nobody. If you cannot get a confession right away, you just create one. He's now reading up on the allegations exposed by the confessed killer's lawyer, Scott Sanders. As veteran informant Mark Scott Cleveland explained, truth doesn't matter. A way you can get around 
maybe not being able to, to get a confession right away is to create one. This, these are the people that the, that the Orange County DA are hinging cases on. There's an irony here in the sense that now you find yourself firmly on the same side as the attorney who's actually arguing for her killer. You ever think about that? I do. Mr. Sanders is, is doing his job above and beyond. I only wish that the DA had the integrity to handle it the way he, he is. We wouldn't, we, we, I wouldn't be in this spot. Michael Oku, Al Jazeera, Orange County, California.